It's Daniel Martin here with you on Body and Soul Upsize. Thanks so much for joining me. It is your daily health check on 938 Live. In this edition, did you know that uh, using the public bathroom or public pools could potentially increase the risk of you developing certain conditions on your skin that you wish you never had? Certain allergies or skin conditions could be worsened. Well, we're going to help you understand how and you can protect yourself and how you can treat some of these issues if they were to turn up. I'm thinking about things like viral warts, folliculitis, rashes and more. Dr. Eugene Tan joins us. He's an associate consultant from the National Skin Centre Singapore, part of the National Healthcare Group. Dr. Tan, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on the program today. Are we think really that using the public pool or the public bathroom could really raise my risk of infection? Thank you, Daniel. Thanks for having, having me here. Yes, indeed, there are many hazards that we should be aware of when using public swimming pools and bathtubs and shower facilities. I think the main kind of problem that we should be concerned about will be infections. For example, bacteria such as Pseudomonas can be found in swimming pools and bathtubs. They are inadequately disinfected and this can, ca- can cause folliculitis, which appears as pimple-like lesions on the skin that can discharge pus. In addition, viral warts, which is caused by the human papilloma virus or HPV, can also be acquired through these uh, public areas and the risk will increase if we walk barefoot for example in public showers or changing rooms and if we get a small cut in the skin on the sole if we do not notice them then we may acquire the infection because the virus may then enter the skin Really? Okay my listeners if you have had this or if you're worried about getting this feel free to join in 669-11938 Dr. Tan why are these viruses or bacteria there? Is it because these are areas that are high usage or is it the presence of the water? What, what, why is it there? I think this kind of uh, bacterial viruses and fungi, they are commonly present in the environment. So certain organisms may be present in wet areas such as swimming pools, bathtubs. So these are actually quite ubiquitous in the environment. Really? Oh no. Okay, okay. And also it just so happens that I guess, you know, so many people are using the, the same changing room in the gym or the same public restroom. It increases the risk of it happening there. Uh, yes, I would think so because infections can spread from people to people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So this is uh, one way of spreading infection as well in those uh, very crowded and popular areas. But hang on, let's go to that swimming pool. I mean, I, I get if you're walking barefoot around the, the swimming pool area or something, I get that. But in the water as well? I mean, isn't there chlorine to, to kill off infection or, or germs and stuff like that? So chlorine is a commonly used disinfectant in swimming pools. It's a very effective uh, agent because it actually kills bacteria, viruses and fungi. But however, excessive exposure to chlorine can irritate the skin and can cause excessive skin dryness. And in patients with sensitive skin, the chlorine may actually irritate the skin, cause uh, rashes and may aggravate the uh, patient's eczema as well. Oh, so even though the chlorine is there to supposedly do something good, it could aggravate some of your existing conditions? Yes, I think it's a double-edged sword. And it might not kill off some of the bacteria or virus? I think it depends on how adequately chlorinated the water is. Mm. So it uh, definitely doesn't kill all kinds of organisms. Oh no, okay, so if your kids are in the pool every day downstairs, or if you're taking your daily morning swim, you could be putting yourself at risk. Is the risk very high though? I mean, do most of the patients tend to say like, oh yeah, I do swim a lot, or yes, I do use public restrooms a lot, anything like that? I wouldn't say the risk is high, but certain groups of uh, individuals may be more predisposed to having uh, infections or skin problems. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, patients with uh, who are immunocompromised, that means their immune system is weakened, such as the very young or the very old people, they may have a higher tendency to get infections. Mm-hmm. And also uh, people with uh, certain medical conditions such as HIV and diabetes, mellitus, may be more vulnerable to having infections as well because their immune system is weakened. And also people on certain medications that suppress the immune system. I think these are the group of people that we should be concerned about. Okay, so can we uh, do... Uh, Okay, before we talk about trans, um, the actual disease itself, I want to talk a little bit more about transmission. Uh, it, it can just be a very brief, quick exposure. Let's say I just walk barefoot a little bit in the gym or I've used a tap a little bit. Just that, that brief contact is enough? Uh, yes, because sometimes we may get small cuts in the skin, which we may not be aware of because there are no symptoms. For example, stepping on rough surfaces, on pebbles, we may get small abrasions and small cuts. Mm. And if the virus is present on the floor, then this is how the virus can enter through the skin barrier and cause infection. And I guess even easier if you're swimming in a pool where the infection is present because you might be breathing in the water that's infected or whatnot. Uh, not so much breathing in the water. 
but prolonged exposure to water can actually weaken the skin barrier as well. Oh, I see. So that makes it easier for anything to cross or cross that barrier. Uh, yes, because uh, if we soak our skin too long in water, then our skin becomes white, soft and wrinkled. Some what we call maceration. So if the skin is uh, macerated or okay, very soft and white and wrinkled, then the epidermal barrier or the skin barrier actually gets damaged and the skin becomes more vulnerable, more susceptible to having infections. Even in bathrooms? I mean, this is an interesting thing because maybe in your own home bathroom, you're very clean. I know you're, you're washing every day maybe and you're probably saying, how am I going to get in my own bathroom? But let's say you use public restrooms or people love doing staycations now in hotels and hotel bathrooms are high occupancy and things like that. Uh, the bathtub could be a, a problem? I think certain bathtubs uh, may not be adequately disinfected and it's actually difficult to, to tell if a bath, bathtub is clean. So I would suggest uh, to take adequate precautions. You do Especially your own if we are. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if you're doing a staycation, you're going to wash the thing first. La. I suppose uh, cleaning with hot water maybe might help. Oh. But I'm uh, not entirely certain about that. I think it's best to be cautious, especially if we are predisposed to uh, such conditions. So I advise uh, patients whose immune system is compromised or who have uh, those with sensitive skin, such as uh, patients with eczema, to avoid the uh, prolonged exposure to such uh, bathtubs and showers. Let's take some calls at 669-11938. Up first, hi, who's this? Hello. Hello. Hi, what's your name? Hi, my name is Irene. Hi, Irene. What's your question for Dr. Tan? Okay, um, I understand that um, I used to have um, hives after I went to the pool. Right. Yeah, so um, my condition didn't improve. So I was wondering whether is there anything I can um, improve to actually... Um, does it? Um, do you still go swimming regularly? Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, not, not really. Not, not now. Not anymore. Okay. Let's talk about that. The hives she mentioned, um, Doctor Tan, is that could that be something that happens because of swimming pool exposure and things like that? I think there are many causes of hives, what we call urticaria, uh, medically, and one of the most common cause, actually the most common cause is idiopathic, which means the cause is not known. But uh, however, there can be some other causes such as upper respiratory tract infections, allergies to medications of food allergies, and uh, sweating even can cause a uh, hives as well. So I think it's important to take a full history to examine the patient and to find out what's the cause of the hives so that we can treat the underlying cause if possible. Okay, so the best advice for Irene is to speak to your doctor, get the full history done, know what the triggers are, and really it's about avoiding the triggers as much as possible, right? Uh, yes, it will be important to avoid the triggers, but a lot of times the trigger is often not found. Yeah. So we'll still treat the hives with uh, antihistamines. Antihistamines might be your best bet, Irene. Thanks for your call. Up next, another caller. Hi, who's this? Uh, hi, evening. Uh, hi, I'm Deborah here. Hi, Deborah. Hi, Daniel. Uh, may I find out from doctor? Uh, just now, uh, there's this uh, prolonged exposure to water, like example, I wash my hands. Almost like very often the whole day due to work such of cases. Uh, so the hand does get very uh, white and all this. So what is the best way to protect my hand? Thank you very much, Deborah. Dr. Tan, any advice? I think we do see a lot of patients at the National Skin Center with uh, hand rashes. A lot of times it's a hand eczema and it can be caused by prolonged exposure to water. So if you are in a job or occupation that requires frequent hand washing, frequent use of uh, skin disinfectants or frequent exposure to soaps and detergents, then that will certainly put you at risk. So the best advice is actually to minimize exposure to water and detergents. For example, if you are doing housework, it will be important to wear gloves uh, to protect your hands, to minimize exposure to wet work and to moisturize uh, frequently throughout the day because that can actually improve the skin barrier function. But what if at your job, maybe you're, you're dealing with outdoor stuff or you really have to wash your hands on a frequent basis? Um, like um, Deborah mentioned, I mean, should we not be washing? Should we be using hand sanitizers instead or anything else that can help? I think uh, if you are frequently washing your hands, a possible, way, a possible solution to consider would be to use, hand, to use a soap-free cleansers. Uh, that can actually help to prevent excessive drying of the skin. Okay. Deborah, we're going to have to leave it this day. We'll be returning in just a moment. Thanks so much for your question. So soap-free might be the way to go in that case in terms of the cleansers that you're using for your hands. Uh, let's talk to Dr. Eugene Tan more as I'll explore what exactly some of these conditions like viral warts and folliculitis look like. Dr. Eugene Tan's an associate consultant from the National Skin Center. Body and Soul continues.
with body and soul. Do you use the swimming pool a lot? Do you use the changing room at the gym on a frequent basis? Could you be exposing yourself to certain skin problems that can emerge because of bacterial or viral infection? Things like viral warts, even, or folliculitis. We'll find out more about that right now with Dr. Eugene Tan, an associate consultant from the National Skin Centre Singapore, a member of the National Healthcare Group. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to join us now at 669-11938. Maybe you're a heavy pool user or heavy gym changing room user and you're a little bit concerned yourself, or you might have had some of these problems and you've dealt with it but not very successfully. 669-11938. Dr. Tan, you say one of the most common things that you tend to see at the National Skin Centre, viral warts. And this is from yes. HPV exposure it's from human papillomavirus that's right so I mean this could be in the water in the swimming pool or around the area even yes uh, frequently on uh, hard surfaces hard surfaces such as the uh, floors around the swimming pool in uh, public places like the gyms in halls mm. in uh, public changing rooms and showers what do the viral warts look like when they emerge how does somebody know it is a viral wart so viral warts are typically present as small little lumps of uh, varying sizes and on closer inspection, they actually have a cauliflower appearance oh, on the surface. Really? Oh gosh, are they painful? They are frequently uh, asymptomatic. That means uh, the patient does not complain of pain or itch. But in some cases, the warts can be painful can be, or can be itchy. And most warts on the soles of the feet tend to be painful when the patient walks and steps on the warts. I can imagine. And can th- will it just be one? Can there be many? Will it spread? How does it? I mean, what's the, the manifestation here? So some patients uh, only present with one wart. Whereas I've seen patients who present with multiple watts, even at more than 20 watts. So this can be quite uh, difficult to treat. Okay, I've seen a picture, a couple of pictures. Like, go, 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 if you want to scare yourself, <laughs> go and Google an image of viral warts. They do look quite sci-fi. It looks like crystalline structures on your body. And it looks possibly painful. But like you said, for some people more so than others. I, I would imagine that for some people, the first thing they'll try and do is they will grab a pair of scissors or nail clippers and try and just slice it off. They think it's some excess skin growth or anything like that. Is that a bad idea with viral warts? So generally, we don't advise patients to meddle with their warts. And definitely, the patients should not be cutting their warts because they tend to injure the skin and they may potentially spread the virus around to other areas of the skin. So the, this is how the wart can actually spread and propagate. Oh, gosh. Does that mean that you've become an HPV carrier after this kind of exposure, potentially? So a lot of times, uh, our immune system can actually clear the virus over time. But if our immune system doesn't clear the virus, then the wart gets bigger or it may grow more. Then, then the patient will need treatment. Okay, and what is the kind of treatment for an, uh, a viral war? If somebody comes in and sees you, how can you deal with it? Can you deal with it successfully? Uh, yes, viral wars can be successfully treated, although it may take time. So the first line of treatment will be salicylic acid-based therapies, okay. where the patient applies a lotion on the ward itself. And if, it, if that does not work, then we'll go on to liquid nitrogen treatment, or what we call cryotherapy. And the patient needs to attend uh, the treatment every one to two weeks until the ward clears. And that could take weeks, months? That could take uh, typically between like four to ten treatments. Four to ten? Or even more. Oh my goodness, okay. I suppose it depends on how, how advanced it is. It depends on the size of the ward and the, the nature of the ward itself. Okay, but once it's cleared, once it's removed, that's it, it's not going to grow back? So, in our experience, there's about a 30% risk of recurrence uh, with a viral wards, even though they are treated. So it's important to watch out for recurrence even though the warts may have cleared with treatment. Okay, got it. Viral warts, something to worry about just from you using that public restroom or bathroom may be. Dr. Tan, you mentioned as well folliculitis. What's that? So folliculitis is a skin infection where the hair follicles are actually infected with a bacteria or can be infected with a fungus as well. Mm. And that causes a pimple-like uh, lesions to appear on the skin. It can occur on anywhere in the body, usually on the trunk and on the limbs. A pimple like does that mean it's pus filled as well? It can be pus filled or it can be just a small bit lumps. Goodness gracious. Okay, so that's about that's affecting the follicle of your body hair. The hair follicles, that's right. What happens if you have this? How do you deal with that? So it's important to identify the cause of the folliculitis, see whether it is caused by bacteria or fungus. So we can actually do a skin scrape uh, in our clinic to distinguish between the two. Sometimes just by looking at the distribution of the folliculitis or how it looks like. We're able to tell the difference between the two mm. and then we will treat the patient accordingly. And this is oral medication or...? So again, uh, there can be oral medications. Uh, as, sorry, uh, topical treatment as first line or if the lesion is 
very extensive, or if the patient fails topical treatment, then I will go on to oral medications. Okay. Such as antibiotics or antifungal agents. Ah, antifungal agents. Okay. Speaking of fungal issues, I mean, I often hear people talk about, you know, oh yeah, I got a lot of white spots on my body. I swim a lot. That's why this happens. Can that, is, is there a link there? Fungal infections and water exposure? Uh, yeah. Some people who sweat a lot or who are always exposed to water, they, are, they tend to get these uh, fungal infections and that can cause white spots to occur. So medically, we call this a uh, tenial versicolor. I've heard that people who, like you said, sweat a lot, even their backs could have it. Yes, uh, so this condition tends to uh, affect uh, the trunk, the back, the chest, sometimes the arms as well. Is it the same course of approach or, or, or treatment here? We try topical first? Yes, so we can normally clear the this kind of rash with with a topical treatment, building which will go on to oral antifungal therapy. Okay, it's good to know that there are options. You won't be stuck with some of these viral warts or rashes, but it does require a little bit of commitment of time. It takes uh, a while to deal with. Yes, so, so certain conditions uh, take a longer time to be treated, such as viral warts, so definitely we will require patients in dealing with them, while certain conditions like fungal infections or bacterial infections may be treated with a short course of appropriate treatment. Okay, depending on what you have. Six six nine one one nine three eight. Let's go to the phone. Hi, who's calling? Hello. Hi, what's your name? Who is that? You called through. Hello. Hello, I can hear you. So soft. Okay, well we'll continue. Uh, we'll try and get that person patched through properly. Okay. Six six nine one one nine three eight. If you have any questions, you can call through to our hotline right now. Doctor Tan, let's talk a little bit about children because you know, for many people, after school, the kids might be in the pool. There might be frequent swimming lessons weekend swims and things like that downstairs in the condo or the public pool are children a little bit more at risk here? Uh, uh, definitely because children are young children especially they have weaker immune systems so they are more vulnerable to having infections and also about 20% of our school children have eczema or sensitive skin so many? Uh, yes based on a local study Goodness. so these patients uh, will, will find that they, their skin is more sensitive to chlorine to excessive uh, exposure to water they may get a flare of eczema or they may get a bit rashes, dry skin. So what do we do to protect? Our, I, mean, I suppose older people fall into that category as well. Yes. A bit more susceptible. So, okay, what do we need to do? I, I know our parents are listening in and, and they want to protect their children. They want to protect themselves. What are the prevention options here? So generally, it's good practice uh, to have a quick shower before swimming mm. so that we do not contaminate the pool. That will prevent uh, infections. And also, during swim, uh, just, just before swimming, it will be good practice to empty one's bowels and bladders so that we do not accidentally release fecal and urine material into the pool mm. because there's a major source of infections to other swimmers. So generally we try to keep swimming uh, short so that there's no prolonged exposure to water and chlorine. So I would say less than 30 minutes would be good. Less than 30 minutes yes, would be good. for swimming and for showering I'll keep it to less than 15 minutes using cool water and the warm water. I try to avoid showering with hot water because hot water can damage the skin barrier and can cause skin inflammation. You mentioned as well that, you know, weakening of the skin barrier with too much exposure in the water, whether it's, you know, frequent washing or swimming mm -hmm. a lot. Can we do anything to strengthen the skin barrier? So it would be important to moisturize frequently. For example, if we are swimming, then after swimming, we should immediate, immediately shower to wash off the chlorinated water from our skin and then apply moisturizer liberally all over the body. Okay, prevention, regular maintenance, those are keys. Dr. Tan, I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you very much, Daniel. Helping us understand our risk of exposure to certain things that could cause some of these problems. Skin hazards in your bathroom, the public bathroom, in the pool, in the bathtub, the changing room. Now we know better. Dr. Eugene Tan, an associate consultant from the National Skin Center, Singapore, a member of the National Healthcare Group, joined us on today's edition of Body and Soul. I'm Daniel Martin. Thanks so much for joining me.